Hello, I'm Darwin Seiler, a retired Advanced Placement American History teacher and current member of the board of Monterey Pass Battlefield and Park. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the battle for you and uh, go over some of the high points. Thank you. On the night of July 3rd and early morning hours of July 4th, 1863, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee was faced with the task of extracting his army and plunder from Pennsylvania and eventually back to Virginia. Lee, after careful consideration, chose two routes of retreat from Gettysburg, which would eventually lead him to Williamsport, Maryland, and then across the Potomac into Virginia. The first route was led by Brigadier General John M. Bowden, and that was through the Cashtown Gap, which is represented in red here, through the Cashtown Gap to eventually near Chambersburg, and then south towards Williamsport. That route follows essentially what is modern day 30 and modern day 11. The second was, and most direct, was through Monterey Gap, where a hub of roads converging, including the Mariah Furnace Road, the Hagerstown Road, the Emmitsburg Waynesboro Turnpike and the old Georgetown Road all converged at a toll house on the uh, Emmitsburg Waynesboro Pike. Whoever controlled this hub controlled all traffic in the Cumberland Valley north and south and east and west. All these roads intersected near a toll house of the Emmitsburg Waynesboro Pike. On this retreat route, Lieutenant General Yule's supply train and other reserve supply trains stretched from Fairfield, Pennsylvania to Hagerstown, Maryland, a distance of over 17 miles. Intermingled among these wagons were several thousand head of livestock and a number of free African Americans being sent south and back into slavery. The entire route was along a road, very narrow, very mountainous, and because of the pouring rain, deep in mud, which caused problem after problem for the Confederate retreat. It is the Union attack on this supply train that becomes known as the Battle of Monterey Pass. Certainly not your typical battle. This battle is fought at night. It's fought during thunderstorm, it's fought during intense darkness, and interestingly enough, it's fought, fought on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, there's a lot of civilian interaction, and it is fought in two states and four counties. The battle included an interesting cast of participants, including Brigadier General Justin Kirkpatrick, who is the head of the 3rd Cavalry. Known as Kill Cavalry, this three times great grandfather of Anderson Cooper was a drinker, a carouser, and whose greatest talent, quote, was his ability to ingratiate himself to those who could help his career, according to a historian. But he was brave, rash, and impulsive. So Patrick's counterpart was Brigadier General William Jones. Nicknamed Grumble, he was noted for being irritable and peculiar. Perhaps this is due to the fact that in 1852, his new bride was swept from his arms during a storm and drowned off the coast of Galveston, Texas. Serving under Kilpatrick was General George Armstrong Custer, who we all know, sometimes referred to as the Boy General. Flamboyant, one soldier said, quote, he looked more like a circus rider in his custom uniform than a general. But as we also know, he was much like Kilpatrick, brave and impulsive. He was the head of the 2nd Brigade, which was known as the Michigan Wolverines, and included the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Cavalry. According to legend, at one point in the battle, he actually falls off his horse and is rescued by his troops. 
Also on the Union side is Major Charles Capehart of the 1st West Virginia Cavalry. Capehart was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Monterey Pass. His citation reads, quote, For extraordinary heroism on 4 July 1863, an action at Monterey Pass, he charged down a mountainside in heavy rain upon the enemy's fleeing train. Many wagons were captured and destroyed, and many prisoners taken. On the Confederate side, among the notable participants, was John, Major John Harmon, a large profane man who is in charge of the organization and the conduct of the wagon train. According to a contemporary, his language, quote, could produce a volume of oaths that would excite the envy of the most scientific mule driver. He re received his orders from General Yule, who said, Get these wagons to Williamsport, or I never want to see your face again. One can only imagine what Harmon's reply was. Confederate Captain George E. Mack of the 1st Maryland Cavalry Company B, early in the war, a spy and an interrogator at Libby Prison. E. Mack was the first to initiate contact in the battle. As evidence of the ferocity of the battle, Emac will eventually be shot through both arms, receive saber cuts on both arms and shoulders, have a horse shot out from underneath him, and struck with shell on his right knee. In a letter home, he will set a letter home dated July 21st, 1863, he said he thought he was, quote, about to go up the spout. Two ordinary citizens of the mountaintop will also play important roles in the battle. Charles Berman, local entrepreneur and farmer, will serve as a guide for the 1st Vermont Cavalry as they move towards Leitersburg, Maryland. 17-year-old Hetty Zeilander, after warning Kirkpatrick of the Confederates ahead, will guide a squadron of the 1st Michigan under Lieutenant Stagg to Fairfield Gap via a farm lane in an attempt to block and separate the wagon train. A Michigan trooper writing after the war in a letter to Teddy said, quote, I never saw your face, but knew your kind and courageous nature. In the morning of July 4th, Kirkpatrick will be ordered to locate and harass Lee's retreating supply train. Around 3 p.m., Kilpatrick's cavalry will depart Emmitsburg, Maryland, on the turnpike towards Monterey Pass. He will command approximately 5,000 troops. Meanwhile, Confederate General Grumble Jones placed Emacs Company B of the 1st Maryland Cavalry as picket protection for the Monterey Pass. EMAC will be deployed on the Emmitsburg Waynesboro Turnpike on the eastern side of the pass. He will place his only cannon in the middle of the road as it starts to rise to the mountaintop. By 9 p.m., with heavy rain falling and dark descending, the advance of the Union Cavalry, led by Custer, will be fired on and attacked by Emac and his 25 more or so troops. The cavalry will withdraw quickly, it will regroup, and Emac will withdraw to the Monterey House. By 9 p.m., with heavy rain falling and dark descending, the advance of the Union Army, led by Custer, will be fired on and attacked by Emac and approximately 25 to 30 troops. The cavalry will withdraw and quickly regroup, while Emac will withdraw back to the Monterey House at the top of the pass. By 10 p.m., Custer's Michigan troops, along with the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry, will attack the front and both flanks of the Confederate position, forcing Emac to pull back to protect the bridge over the raging Red Run Creek. The, ensu the ensuing three hours of combat will be hand-to-hand -hand in a thunderstorm with enemies only able to identify each other by their gunfire light. Add to that scene 
sheep and cattle scared and panicking from the cannon fire onto the retreating train, you have, as one participant put it, quote, a scene wild and desolating. It was during these three hours that General Kirkpatrick split his command and ordered the 1st Vermont under Lieutenant Colonel Preston to intercept the head of the train in Leitersburg, Maryland, and also orders Lieutenant Colonel Stagg and a squadron of 1st Michigan to Fairfield Pass in an ill-fated attempt to halt the train before it reached the summit. Near 3.30 a.m., Colonel Russell, Russell Alger, future governor of Michigan and Secretary of War under President William McKinley, who is the head of the 5th Michigan, will break across the bridge on the turnpike and begin to form battle lines while the Confederates fall back and deploy near the toll house, still protecting the retreating train on Mariah Furness Road. The reinforcing 1st West Virginia and 1st Ohio Cavalries will charge across the bridge and up the hill to begin the route of the Confederate defenses and the wagon train. Kilpatrick will begin to redeploy around the toll house while the wagon train is systematically destroyed between the toll house and Ringgold, Maryland. About the same time, Lieutenant Colonel Preston's 1st Vermont begin destroying approximately three miles of wagons between Leitersburg and Ringgold. A site, quote, which burned bright in the morning star, according to Jacob Stoner, historian from Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. While this destruction was happening, additional Confederate troops, including infantry, began to deploy on Mariah Furnace Road and outnumber and threaten Kilpatrick at the toll house. Kilpatrick will order the remainder of his cavalry to Ringgold, where he will reunite with the 1st Vermont and begin the process of burning most of the captured wagons, thus ending the longest battle of the Civil War in terms of mileage. All told, around 1,500 Confederate casualties, most of them being captured, destruction of nine miles of wagon train, and approximately a hundred Union casualties. In the end, however, the Confederates still controlled the pass, but it deprived the Confederates of valuable supplies, forced a hurried retreat, and possibly saved the area from more foraging and reprisal. And third, perhaps prevented a better and more organized plan to hold the pass. However, remember, the war continues, and more people will die after Gettysburg than before. As you look behind my back, right down there at the crest of the hill is where the first contact was made for the Battle of Monterey Pass. This is the original emmitsburg Waynesboro Pike, and it's at that point that Captain Tanner who had actually got uh, misplaced from Imboden's uh, command and was really here by happenstance, he had one Napoleon cannon and five shots. With Custer's Michigan men in the lead as Kilpatrick came up, up the hill, Tanner unloosened two shots, and at that time, Emac spread out on both sides was somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 50 men would attack downhill and uh, rout and confuse and, and really scare the bejesus out of the uh, Union Cavalry at that point in time. The Union Cavalry will take a little bit, but they will regroup. And what Kilpatrick will do will place his men on either flank, and they will begin a flanking movement here. As we look at it on my left would be the Michigan group. On the right would be the 8th Pennsylvania uh, cavalry, and as they pushed up the hill, both Emac and Tanner withdrew back to where the Monterey Inn is, which is about 200 yards in that in the direction as I'm facing. And at that time, they will redeploy, and the battle will continue from there. 
Uh, this is the site of probably the most intense fighting during the battle. Now we remember that it, it, it's raining, it's thundering, it's lightning. Uh, some of the accounts talk about the stream right down here that we'll show you in a minute about it. They can hear it running before they get there. Uh, what has happened is the Confederates have aligned themselves and deployed on the other side of the bridge down here, which I hope we get a chance to take a look at it. And the Union Army has deployed on this side, the Union Cavalry. Uh, the Michigan troops are on what would be the left side of or the left flank, and uh, Custer's men and some of his other men are over on this flank, and some of the 1st Michigan are right on the road. But they are stymied at this small bridge right here. The Confederates have committed every per possible person they can to holding the, the bridge and preventing the, the Union from getting across it. In fact, at one point in time, General Grumble Jones will order his staff, his aides, and anybody who can fire a gun, including the wounded, into the fray here. He himself will actually join the fray, and at one point in time, the hand-to-hand -hand combat is so intense that Jones will tell his men, don't call me General, call me Bill. And later on, he'll get separated from his troops and spend about a day wandering around in southern Franklin County and most of Washington County until he will get back to Williamsport where he will assume, assume command of the defenses until Robert E. Lee gets there. 3 a.m. on uh, the morning of July 5th, the Michigan troops will actually, they'll actually have trooper crawl out on this bridge to see if the planking is still there. It's too dark and it's raining too much, they can't tell. They will crawl out the bridge, they will see that the planking is still there and uh, the 1st, 5th, and 6th Michigan will rush the bridge and deploy on the west side of Red Run and begin to force the Confederates back towards the toll house, which is really on the top of the hill over there. Uh, it's at that time that Kilpatrick will send two reserve units, the 1st West Virginia Cavalry and the 1st Ohio Cavalry, into the action they will actually rush the bridge on horseback, being the first ones to do that. They will be given orders not to use their guns, just to use their sabers and quote unquote, cut anything that looks like a man. The head of the West Virginia Cavalry at the time, Major Charles Capehart will actually be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions here. And they will charge up that far hill over there and they will take uh, the Confederate artillery that is stationed around the toll house. Our third and final stop is at the site of the final breakthrough of the uh, Union Cavalry. As we see, this is the original toll house on the Emmitsburg Waynesboro Turnpike. The Mariah Furnace Road, which was called the Hagerstown Road or the main road for the Confederate wagon train, passed by the toll house just on the other side, coming from the mountain over there in the background. During most of the battle, this was controlled by the Confederates, and they had posted cannons on the far side of the, the toll house and really were deployed on both sides of the toll house as far as they could to prevent. That was uh, mostly Emacs men. A uh, small portion of the 6th Virginia Cavalry and the 4th North Carolina. We already talked about Cape Hart's breakthrough, and it's this road right here that he, in with on on horseback, begins to destroy the wagon train. From here, another seven miles down to uh, the area of Ringgold, Maryland. Once this area is secured, and once Cape Hart has his breakout, the Union artillery will set up here. And in fact, one account talks about setting up between the toll house and about where we're standing, where was the barn and they begin shelling the rest of the Confederate train down in that direction. By about five o'clock in the morning, Kilpatrick is here, the entire Union cavalry has come from this direction, and the Confederates are beginning to be reinforced by infantry. And it's at that point that Kilpatrick will move the rest of his troops to Ringgold, he'll re, uh, reconnect with the 1st Virginia, 
and at that time they will destroy the wagons that they have in their possession, thus ending the Battle of Monterey Pass at about 7 a.m. on the morning of July 5th. Welcome to our museum, the Battle of Monterey Pass Museum. Please come on in, we're glad to have you. What I would like to do is take this opportunity to show you some of our exhibits and, and emphasize the, what we think are the high points, although there are a ton of other things here to take a look at. Initially, what I'd like to take a look at is this rifle over here, which was actually found in the rafters of a wall during a remodeling project. Uh, it's believed that it was part of Neal's brigade who followed the battle across Monterey Pass and was probably dropped in, in their maneuvers at the time. This is one of my favorite artifacts that we have. This is the diary of Henry Bonebrake, who was from Waynesboro, uh, part of the 17th Pennsylvania Company G Calvary and a Medal of Honor winner at the Battle of Five Forks. Although Henry Bonebrake and the 17th Pennsylvania Company G did not fight at Monterey Pass, they actually used this thoroughfare to get to Gettysburg and were among the first engaged on the far right flank on day one uh, in the battle. The diary itself begins in 1864 and, and ends in 1865 when he comes home, but among the entries in it is Henry Bonebrake was in Washington, D.C. when Abraham Lincoln was shot and killed and he records his feelings and observations in that. This is an exhibit of dug artifacts from the battle site area. Most of these have been donated by a variety of different people who have been very generous with our museum. In this exhibit, we have uh, four rifles from the Civil War era. Bottom two here are kind of interesting. They were found in the Potomac River around Harper's Ferry at a time when it was dry and, and the, the river had receded a whole lot. And I guess the mud must have preserved the rifles. This one here is an 1842 Harper's Ferry musket. It's a 69 caliber. And it's interesting because it has a bullet, in, uh, uh, bullet hole in the forearm and has the gentleman's name engraved in the stock. This is one of our displays that we absolutely know the person was here and, and the uniform was here. This is an officer's frock coat from Captain William Wilkin, who was part of the 1st Virginia Cavalry during the battle. Uh, the 1st Virginia Cavalry actually is the cavalry unit that was led by Major Capehart, who in fact wins the Medal of Honor, or wins the Medal of Honor in his engagement here. This display shows the typical uh, weapons and accoutrements that a cavalry uh, trooper would have during the, the battle. And of course, this was primarily a cavalry battle. Some of the uh, more outstanding ones, this Spencer rifle here was uh, relatively new by the time Battle Monterey uh, Pass started. These were actually used by two of Custer's units uh, the Confederates said that the problem with the Spencer rifle was that you could load on Sunday and shoot all day. The Colt 45 revolver back, or Colt 36 revolver back here, would have been used by either side on on this battle, as well as the the saber. Another example of, of an artifact that we are pretty sure, about 99% sure, was here. Uh, this is actually a slicker worn by James Monroe Deans, who was part of the 1st Maryland Cavalry on the Union side. Deans is an, an interesting character. He actually is better known for writing the best-selling music book for school children, and as well as an American opera called A Nebuchadnezzar. But this was his slicker, and because of the conditions, we're pretty sure it was used here. Two outside features of our museum that we think are very important. The first is this Maryland, or excuse me, Michigan Cavalry Brigade sign, 
uh, actually put up by the state of Michigan and plays a role in our actual formation as, as a museum. Uh, the state of Michigan would not put the sign on private property. Therefore, we as a Washington Township and, and board were compelled to find uh, public held property. And of course, this being site zero from the battle was just a, a perfect place. And we've had a lot of help in, in acquiring this, this site. Perhaps the most important feature of our museum is the plaque dedicated to Corporal Joseph Brubaker, Jr., who died in action in Vietnam. The backstory is when we purchased the property, there was a pavilion made out of mountain stone that Corporal Brubaker's father had built as part of the grieving process for his only son. We were going to originally use that pavilion, but it was in disrepair and wasn't going to meet code and just was unsuitable. But every one of those stones from that pavilion was used on our museum. And one of the first things we did upon opening the museum was to have a rededication to Corporal Brubaker. A number of his fellow Marines showed up for it, including his cousin from New Jersey. They sent us this rubbing from the Vietnam Memorial. Hi, I'm uh, Lee Royer, Chairman of the Friends of Monterey Pass, and I'm here to show you what we have and what we've been able to accomplish in the five or six years that we've been here. This is a, this is a museum, and as you can tell, this is a new bridge we've just built to get to our walking trails, to get people safely across Charmaine Road where the battle was, and onto our walking trails. This is a, the start of our trail network. Uh, what you see here, this is Billy Yang Trail. This leads us up to Monterey Peak at the Mulch Trail, easy to walk. And then uh, as going around, you can see Brown Springs Trail, which connects to Mariah Furnace Road, the historic uh, road for, that the Confederates retreated on. From here you can see this comes off the uh, Billy Yank Trail, and so we'll walk over here and we'll show you the scouting area that we want to encourage all the scouts to use, and hopefully they'll build tent platforms for themselves over here. Here we are at our, what we call, scout camping area, but this is really a camping area for anybody and everybody to come up here and camp. Uh, we feel as though you ought to notify the township when you're coming, uh, but other than that, um, you're welcome to come up here and camp. This is the uh, intersection of Billy Yank Trail, which goes off here to my right. Uh, and that's a mulch trail that you can walk and go down to Mariah Furnace Road. On our left over here is the Peak Monterey Peak Trail, and it's stone the whole way up to Monterey Peak. Here we are, we've climbed up the Monterey Peak Trail and we're up here at the end of it to our observation deck. So you can see over to Fairfield and with a good set of binoculars you can see clear over to Gettysburg. So this is the height of the Monterey Peak Trail. Also we want to uh, impress upon everyone that we have a handicap accessible overlook up here so they can get a view of the overlook also. now on Mariah Furnace Road, the historic retreat trail that's exactly as it was when the Confederate soldiers retreated from Gettysburg. So you're, we can walk on that and uh, enjoy a piece of history and as you can see we have interpretive markers the whole way along the trail explaining the trail 
and explaining things about the people who traveled here and, and about the battle. Hi, my name is John Gorman. I'm a lifelong resident of Blue Ridge Summit, Pennsylvania, and a member of the Monterey Pass Battlefield Association. The, uh, the effort to start telling the story of Monterey Pass really started in 1890 when a local historian by the name of Jacob Stoner petitioned the War Department and the Battlefield Commission to do something with this fourth day of Gettysburg, as he called it. Uh, but nothing really happened until 1940 when the state put up a small roadside marker that's still there today. Then around 1963, um, leading up to the centennial of Gettysburg and Monterey's battlefield battle, um, the local paper, the Record Herald, was lamenting the fact that a lot of the local knowledge that was in the area about what happened to the battle was being lost, and no one was recording it or interpreting the site. In 1975, a local resident, Mary Ray Cantwell, started encouraging the township to do something with this place up on Blue Ridge Summit. It's a great story to tell, and it might be good for the township. But it wasn't until around the late 90s, 1999 or so, that a, a young couple, John and Alicia Miller, started really raising awareness about the battle when they started writing articles for the Emmitsburg Historical Society about what happened up here. In 2001, they moved into Adams County, into Fountaindale, and realized that they were sitting on a battlefield and on their own started making homemade memorial or markers and started putting them around different places in Fountaindale and Blue Ridge Summit. About 2004, Mary Ray Cantwell buys uh, the Brubaker property that eventually became the site of the museum. 2006, the Monterey Pass Battlefield Association forms, which was a, a township committee that sort of advising the township on things that we could do up here in Blue Ridge. We became incorporated as the Friends of Monterey Pass in 2011. And by 2015, we raised enough money for a museum. And in 2017, the township acquired another 125 acres that um, also contained a large portion of the Mariah Furnace Road. So really the story of how we started is the story of a, a lot of local people who uh, have a passion for history and what happened up here. The land the museum is on was previously owned by the Joe Brubaker family, a highly decorated Marine Airman, um, and we told you about him earlier in the video. Ray Cantwell eventually purchased this land and turned it over to the township. Now, Ray Cantwell is one of these interesting people that you could write novels about. Uh, she was an air attaché. Well, she worked for the air attaché's office at the U.S. Embassy in The Hague in post-World War II and eventually um, worked as a congressional liaison for the chief of staff of the United States Air Force. Uh, during her times in The Hague, she often referred to two of her friends that were lifelong friends called Bernie and Freddie. And turned out to be Prince Bernard of the Netherlands and Frederick Heineken of that Heineken family. So she's been there from the beginning, pushing the township to do something and pushing us to do something with the site. And of course, there would be no museum or battlefield without the efforts of John and Alicia Miller. Uh, for over 20 years, you know, they've worked tirelessly to uh, research and interpret and then help develop uh, what became the museum and what is the museum and park today. Of course, all projects need a sponsor. Um, we found ours with Washington Township, Mike Christopher, Township Manager. And uh, through his efforts, they, the township and the supervisors um, drove the efforts to get, get state funding for the land that encompasses the museum and the Battlefield Park. Uh, Friends of Monterey Pass, uh, we started again as a township committee, became a more formal group, uh, eventually forming a nonprofit. And it was this dedicated band of local history buffs that created and drove the vision of what um, and how to interpret this battle. And it's still a work in progress. We still have other areas that we want to look at and, and acquire, including the Tollgate House. 
Once we acquired the Brubaker property from um, Ray Cantwell, at this point, the community really came together to put this museum together. Um, local Boy Scout troops had Eagle projects there helping build things. The Waynesboro Area Senior High School had a group up to literally chip the cement off of stones from the pavilion that we disassembled so we could repurpose those rocks into our museum. Uh, local foundations donated money. Local contractors donated both time and materials to help us. Our local garden club to this day still helps with plantings on the site. Uh, so when this came together, it was truly a community effort. And of course, um, going from a roadside marker in the 1940s to what we have today required many partnerships. Again, the township, the county commissioners, of Franklin County, County Board of Tourism, um, state, local governments, they all really came together to help us. Uh, and in particular, the state's DCNR has uh, really been a great backer of ours. They've been up to the site many times. Uh, Secretary, Secretary Dunn has been there several times. And they're really excited about what we're doing and what we're not only tell the story, but to preserve a lot of the land that's up there. We formed other partnerships along the way uh, with the Michigan State of Michigan, the Michigan History Foundation. Um, at the time, one of only four Michigan markers that was outside the state of Michigan was put at the site of the museum. So we were very excited by that. Early in our fundraising efforts, we had Ed Beers, who is the Chief um, Historian Emeritus of the National Park Service, along with Ted Alexander, uh, who was the Chief Historian for the Antietam Battlefield, along with county officials, uh, held a fundraiser at our local fire department to raise money and awareness for this place. Of course, the list of uh, partners that we had are, are numerous. You can see them here. Um, it would just be too long to list all these names. But in addition to everybody that's listed here, there are hundreds and hundreds of private donors that continue to support us. And the park continues to evolve. Um, we are really still a work in progress. Our site also has many other stories to tell about what happened around the museum and Blue Ridge Summit. Uh, there's General Johnson's ginseng farm. He was part of General Washington's surgical staff, and he raised ginseng at a meadow next to the museum in order to start trade with China. Uh, Monterey Peak, we have a trail to the top. They have among the oldest rocks in the United States of America. The Mariah Furnace Road was actually the original Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, the first colonial road out west. The Mason-Dixon line is fairly close, and there's a, a crown stone up there. Interestingly enough, the Monterey Springs Hotel, which was used as a headquarters for both the Union and Confederate armies during this battle, was in later years the birthplace of Wallace Warfield Simpson, who was the Washington socialite that King Edward of England advocated his throne for. Also nearby is uh, Fort Ritchie that has an interesting early history of the OSS during World War II. OSS eventually became the CIA. So lots of, lots of different stories to tell up here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your time and your attention. We hope you enjoyed this. We hope you found it informative. Uh, we are open for the season starting in April. We will be open every Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 4 until early in November. We certainly hope to see you here. And again, thanks for your time.